tonight. As the GOP unifies behind Donald Trump, the latest on the ground from the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. And while Israeli airstrikes target Hamas in Gaza, it finances Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, all in its proxy wars. New warnings about the danger Iran poses to the region. Plus, faith and fitness. We want to help people uh, be strong, um, not for any vain reasons, but so they can serve the Lord with, with all their strength. How some in the church are working to put new emphasis on healthy living to bring honor to God. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Senator J.D. Vance makes his national debut addressing the country for the first time as Donald Trump's running mate. Good evening and welcome to Faith Nation from our Washington News Bureau. I'm John Jessup. Well, night three of the Republican National Convention looks at a second Trump term on the world stage. The headliner tonight, Trump's VP pick, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, who delivers his highly anticipated convention speech. CBN's Brody Carter has more on what to expect from this evening's main event. Brody. John, the slogan is Make America Strong Once Again, theme for night three of the Republican National Convention, where party leaders will focus on immigration and national security. 35 million people have tuned into the Republican National Convention so far, watching as once political rivals, including former Republican presidential candidates Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, gave unwavering support for Donald Trump. Donald Trump has my strong endorsement, period. Tonight, all eyes turn to Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance, set to give his speech tonight. Running mates are also often the uh, chief attack dog uh, for the ticket. And so he's going to, I'm sure, talk about President Biden's record. He's going to talk about Vice President Kamala Harris. And I expect uh, J.D. Vance to have a very receptive audience. Faith Nation contributor and editor of Inside Elections, Nathan Gonzalez. Anytime he makes an appearance, Republicans are very excited. When he takes to that stage, I think he's going to find a very friendly crowd. He's going to feed off that energy. As for the investigation into Saturday's assassination attempt, House Speaker Mike Johnson has called for the head of the Secret Service to step down, citing a blatant security failure. He also wants to form a bipartisan task force to investigate the assassination attempt on Trump. The answers that they are providing to us thus far are not satisfactory. And so I announced this morning that we're going to set up a special task force, a precision strike on this. It'll be a bipartisan investigatory um, uh, group, and they will have subpoena authority. We're going to get down to the bottom of this quickly. One new aspect to this convention that wouldn't have existed, I think, without the assassination attempt is the is the fight, fight, fight chant. Uh, that is one of the, over the first two days of the convention, the fight, fight, fight from the delegates and, and around the arena has become a rallying point or rallying cry uh, throughout this process. And looking ahead, President Trump will speak on Thursday, and then he and Vance are going to be holding a rally Saturday in the battleground state of Michigan, just one week after the assassination attempt on the former president. John? All right, CBN's Brody Carter in our Virginia Beach headquarters. Thank you so much, Brody. Well, moving away from the RNC, President Biden's weighing Supreme Court reforms. The proposals under consideration would include establishing term limits for justices and enforcing an ethics code, although those require congressional approval. The move comes after growing outrage by Democrats over decisions on abortion and federal regulatory powers and recent ethics questions surrounding undisclosed donations and conflicts of interest concerning Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. As President Joe Biden wraps up two days of campaigning in Nevada, a new national poll taken after Trump's assassination attempt shows a tight race, Trump leading Biden 43 to 41 percent. Biden also faces new challenges from within his own party, while some lawmakers have drafted a letter urging the DNC to postpone an early virtual roll call for the Democratic National Convention. California Congressman Adam Schiff has called for Biden to drop out of the presidential race. Well, for more now, let's bring in Mark Caleb Smith, director of the Center for Political Studies at Cedarville University. Dr. Smith, welcome to you. So as we just mentioned, Congressman Schiff is perhaps the most prominent Democrat to call for Joe Biden to step down. But a new associated poll out today shows nearly 
two-thirds of Democrats wanting President Biden to withdraw from the race. Uh, Mark, do you see that as a hurdle Mr. Biden can eventually overcome? You know, it's going to come down to uh, whether or not he wants to, to leave the race. I mean, unless the Democrats are willing to invoke the 25th Amendment and effectively remove him as president of the United States, uh, this will ultimately be his decision. Uh, you know, he has said recently that uh, if he gets the right kind of information, maybe he would consider this. Uh, to me, when polling suggests the numbers that you just said, other polling I've seen says that every other Democrat does better now than Mr. Biden against Mr. Trump in head-to-head -head polling. Maybe when he starts to see that information, uh, he'll start to consider it more carefully. Mark, there's this new push from the president we just mentioned on reforming yeah. the Supreme Court uh, on ethics with, a, with an ethics code and term limits. Do you see that actually going anywhere? Not really, honestly. Uh, to, to really, to put term limits on the court uh, or as he's also talking about, maybe to restrict presidential immunity in reaction to the court's recent decision, uh, those would both take constitutional amendments. Um, the Constitution's very clear about uh, what it takes to serve in the court. Restricting their ability to serve would take an amendment process. Right now, amending the Constitution on something that sensitive just seems almost fanciful. Whether you think it's a good idea or not, just may be irrelevant because the politics are just so complicated. The ethics reform maybe has a little bit better chance, but even then, I'm not sure they could really force it onto the court. Um, and so I think these are mostly just signs for Joe Biden to show to his base that he's concerned about it, that he's trying to do something about it, and he'll hopefully gain some political momentum because of that. So it's the penultimate night of the RNC. We get to hear from Senator J.D. Vance, the yep. newest member on the Republican ticket. Uh, what do you think he needs to say tonight as he makes his national debut on the, uh, the national stage? You know, I think we'll have a good sense of uh, how Mr. Trump and Mr. Vance conceive of the campaign based on his talk tonight. Uh, I think there is a class of Republicans that are a little bit worried about J.D. Vance, you know, say, that, say those very large donors uh, the business community, maybe those uh, Haley Republicans have some concerns. He could probably allay some of those concerns. Uh, you know, his very strong populist streak over the last several years where he says things like he has more in common economically with the Bernie Sanders kind of voters than other people, I think that's going to create some, uh, some red flags out of parts of the Republican coalition. If he highlights those things, and that tells me that uh, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are taking this this uh, party into a full populist mindset. Uh, if he sort of downplays them and tries to reach out a little bit to those parts of the party, uh, I think that'll send a slightly different message. And so I'm gonna be curious just to see what his emphasis is, and I think that'll give us a good signal for the, for the immediate future for the Trump-Vance campaign. I have to agree, it'll be interesting how they resolve some of these, uh, what some might see as major differences, some might see as minor differences, yeah. considering that he is can, um, looked at as the future or taking on the mantle of MAGA. Dr. Mark Caleb Smith with Cedarville University, we always appreciate your time and your insights. Thanks for being with right. us. Thank you. Well, New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez is resisting calls from fellow Democrats to resign from office. The pressure mounting after a New York jury found Menendez guilty in his federal corruption case, convicting him on charges including bribery, obstruction of justice, and acting as a foreign agent for accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars in bribes and using his office to benefit New Jersey businessmen as well as foreign governments. Menendez says he will appeal. Coming up, the latest on Israel's war with Hamas and a potential hostage deal when Faith Nation returns. Welcome back. Israeli officials arrived in Cairo today for ongoing talks to secure a ceasefire hostage deal with Hamas. Now, back in Gaza, the IDF carried out attacks against uh, across the Strip, rather. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the pressure is forcing Hamas to cave to Israel's demands. We are making systemic progress in achieving the war goals, freeing hostages, eliminating Hamas, and ensuring Gaza will not be able to pose another threat to Israel. We are achieving these goals thanks to combining military pressure and political pressure. 
Meanwhile, a new report from Human Rights Watch says Hamas committed war crimes and crimes against humanity during the October 7th attack. The NGO urged the group to release the 120 hostages still being held captive in Gaza. Well, while Iran continues to support Hamas, the man you're about to meet in our next story believes Tehran is ripe for revolution. The 63-year-old eldest son of the last Shah of Iran is on a mission to drive out the radical Islamic regime that overthrew his father from power 45 years ago and replace it with a secular democracy. In a CBN News exclusive, he told our George Thomas the Islamic regime is weaker than ever before. Fight for freedom and liberties is a cause that never ends until it's done. Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi is warning the United States and Western powers to not be fooled by the election of Iran's new president, Masoud Pejeshkia. We call this uh, the circus of elections in Iran. At 63, Pahlavi is the regime's most vocal and prominent critic. He calls Pejeshkian a lackey, handpicked by a radical Muslim system bent on keeping Iranians in a constant state of repression and fear. In all these years, it really didn't matter who was presented because all the shots are finally called by Khamenei, the yeah. supreme leader. During a wide-ranging interview, the eldest son of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran, told CBN News that Iranians are clamoring for political change like never before. The regime's own figures demonstrate that at least 73% of the population want another form of government. And I imagine the number is much higher than that, because if you got an actual open polling, you would probably even have in the 90 percentile uh, range. In 1979, as heir to the throne, Pahlavi was in the U.S. training to be a fighter pilot when Muslim radical leaders forced his father to relinquish the monarchy, sending the entire family into exile. Pahlavi says the aftermath led to an Islamic-run regime that would devastate his ancestral homeland where today, 60% of the people live below the poverty line. 45 years of clerical rule uh, in the name of religion uh, and the immediate element of persecution and the fact that our country has fallen behind in terms of being on the route towards progress, because Iran by now should have been the South Korea of the Middle East, instead it's the North Korea of the region. Under the mullah's reign, Iran has become a leading state sponsor of terrorism and the root cause of instability in the Middle East and beyond. It finances Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, all in its proxy wars. And of course, it's all networks of activists that they have that are doing the bidding of the regime in the outside world, even in Western capitals. 45 years after the radical Muslim clerics took over the country, His Royal Highness says that the mullahs of Tehran are weaker than ever before and have lost their legitimacy in the eyes of a majority of Iranians. When you lose your legitimacy, whether it's religious legitimacy or political legitimacy, then you're simply holding on by sheer repression. When you have a regime that is completely delegitimized, when you have people who no longer believe in this system, even if they did at some point and they want out, that makes these systems vulnerable. Case in point, the 2022 nationwide protests that followed the murder of Masa Amini, detained by religious police for allegedly not properly wearing her mandatory hijab. Iranian security forces killed more than 500 protesters and imprisoned some 20,000 people. Pahlavi says this clearly shows Iranians are ready to sacrifice for revolution. Nobody said that freedom comes for free. Uh, the price sometimes is extremely high. But are you willing to say that just because it's too expensive, I'm not going to purchase it and put up with what otherwise would be annihilation, demise? We don't have a choice. We have to do it. We have to do it for survival. We have to do it for sanity. We have to do it for humanity. We have to do it for our own interests, no matter what it takes. Despite Iranian proxy attacks on U.S. troops in the Middle East, acceleration of its nuclear uranium enrichment program and funding of Hezbollah and other terror groups, Pahlavi cannot understand why the Biden administration continues to keep billions of dollars flowing to the terror regime. He says it's time Western governments stop appeasing the mullahs of Tehran. 
And what I have argued for years to foreign governments, particularly Western democracies, has been that your expectation of behavior change from the get-go was a false expectation because you simply haven't recognized the DNA of this regime that needs to do all of it does in order to survive. It's not interested in the welfare of the Iranian people. It's simply aiming to export an ideology to dominate the whole world. Pahlavi, who idealizes Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi for their pursuit of non-violent campaigns for political change, runs the National Council of Iran, whose mission is to replace the current Islamic-led regime with a secular democracy. He wants the world to focus on supporting Iranian people rather than keep coddling the regime's thugs. Even those who believe that maybe we could try and bring reform from within, slowly but surely, have given up on this idea. Look, we cannot have a religious dictatorship in the 21st century. We have to go towards a secular democracy. So that's why I think the majority of Iranians find themselves in the same optic, in the same vision. Knowing the history that you have with your beloved nation, do you ever say, you know what, I think this is too, too tough a fight. Too many innocent people's lives are being taken, and it's been 45 years. Do you ever despair? There were moments in time that I wonder if South Africans would have given up, or people in the Eastern Bloc countries would have given up, and even dissidents in the Soviet Union would have given up. I haven't heard once a dissident anywhere in the planet say, you know what, I give up. You can't give up. It's not an option, and I think Iranians the reason why they haven't given up, the reason why they go to the streets, the reason why they take the risk to be shot in the eye or continue to be uh, murdered by the regime is because they know that um, the only way out is for us to succeed. And if they have to sacrifice themselves so that future generations will, uh, you know, have a, a better life, so be it. Thank you, sir. George yeah. Thomas, CBN News, Washington. George with that exclusive reporting. Thank you so much, George. Up next, how to build your physical and spiritual fitness right after this. Welcome back. The Bible calls our bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit. In reality, though, far too many of us Christians struggle with poor health decisions. CBN News medical reporter Lori Johnson introduces us to a man who's trying to motivate Christians to make faith and fitness a priority. Losing 60 extra pounds made Amanda Kelly feel great again in her own body. I thought I was never going to get back down to size. The transformation, a result of her commitment to follow Jesus. You are building your body up for Christ so that you continue his works and following in his path that he has made for us. A strong Christian woman. She's grateful to her trainer who made sure she did it for the right reasons. I wanted to make the case very clear for the connection between following Christ and living a healthy life. Matt Gay wrote the book Fit Church to help Christians develop physical fitness in their relationship with God. Like your body belongs to God. He teaches people to put the knowledge into practice through personal and online training. We're talking about biblical nutrition and meaningful movement and lifestyle change and goals setting and, and, and how you can do these things under the umbrella of Christ and his word. Sometimes Matt partners with churches to help congregations teach their people about the biblical basis for developing a healthy lifestyle. Too often churches overlook the topics of health and fitness when a lot of people sitting in the pews really struggle with these issues. As a result, they tend to go outside the Christian community for help, which can be problematic. So when, when someone goes to a secular trainer or um, they're looking on some fitness magazine or on Instagram, a lot of times those motivations can be completely vain. It's, it's wrapped up in how you look um, or maintaining some sort of, sort of body image, and a lot of people's identities can get wrapped up in that. That's why Pastor Stephen Roby offers his congregation Matt's Christ-centered health workshops and fitness classes, something he believes most churches need. They reflect America, and you know, six out of 10 people in America have chronic health issues as they age, and a lot of that's self-inflicted. You know, the, the diet, the processed food that we eat, uh, the lack of movement with sedentary lifestyles that we live. 
In fact, church culture can unintentionally make it very difficult for people struggling with a sugar addiction. Because of all the food that we bring to our potluck gatherings, to our small group gatherings where everybody's making their best desserts, they're making all of the special dishes, which usually are really high calorie foods. Pastor Roby believes an important key is Matt's focus on changing to serve God's kingdom and enabling Christians to perform physically demanding activities like mission trips, building homes for the poor and working at shelters. We wanna help people uh, be strong, um, not for any vain reasons, but so they can serve the Lord with, with all their strength. For some, food becomes an idol that robs people of their motivation and ability to serve God to their fullest. Even though gluttony is, you know, a lack of self-control, um, sinful, you know, Proverbs 23 tells us not to be among the drunkards and the gluttons. Um, it's kind of one of those acceptable sins in the church, and I just, I think that's a shame. Matt says resisting temptation begins with discovering the why. We're going to place Christ at the center of this, and we're going to look to him for the help that we need in overcoming some of the deep-rooted issues that you're facing that are causing you to live unhealthy uh, in an unhealthy manner. We're going to take that to him. Followed by learning to trust that God can heal our anxiety better than any bad habit. The Bible is not uh, oblivious to the emotions that we feel. God gives us instruction for how to navigate our emotions in a godly way. So while it may not be easy to adopt a healthier lifestyle, some Christians say with God it's not only possible but necessary. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Coming up, a stop along the career. One school bus driver picks up a world record next on Faith Nation. Finally tonight, a decades-long commitment to driving school buses earned one Minnesota man an impressive new title. Jim Opegard now holds the Guinness World Record for oldest bus driver at, get this, 94 years old. After nearly 50 years of driving for children with special education needs, Opegard's boss says he's never missed even one day of work and still passes his physical and driving tests with flying colors. The record holder says the secret to long life is... God's blessings, and we wish him well. Congratulations to Jim. Well, that does it for tonight's Faith Nation. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.